left hand a little still grows cringes in the shade like a bad vine we can't run but we can't hide from it of all the possible words we only got one we gotta ride on it what we've done we'll never get far from what we leave behind Maybe we can run, 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 but we can hide. We can hide. find the promised land you need to be ready to follow wherever your god leads you are you prepared to journey into uncharted lands somewhat fearful somewhat faithful trip may be forced upon you, like Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem. Though you may grumble, will you go and will you look for the birth of hope and a visit of wisdom? The trip may involve fleeing for your life like the Holy Family going to Egypt as refugees. Will you go to the margins, trusting that you are always safe as long as God is camping with the people? The trip may be dangerous, like the road to Jericho lined with thieves. Will you walk the way with awareness, not like the Levite, but like the Samaritan, prepared to stop and help? The trip may be radically life-changing, like the one Paul took to Damascus. Hold everything loosely, lest you need to be knocked to the ground just to notice the presence of our God. Will you join me, please, in the prayer of invocation? Emmanuel, God with feet, walk with us on this journey. Help us to notice you among us as we strain to see you in front of us. Help us to be prepared for the rough, rocky roads and the hot, stinging sands where your spirit of gentleness blows. Keep us from the uneven ground that we find when we choose to separate ourselves and exclude the other. Remind us that at the base of the cross, it is all level ground and be present, sustaining us in our walking 
that we may feel even our legs praying in the name of the itinerant preacher who showed us the way, Christ our Savior, we pray. Amen. I'll let you in on a little tidbit of information on my, the first installation service I had when I was uh, first ordained and first served a church, the invitation to the, to the, to the um, installation had a picture of the Lorax on it with a quote from the book. But I don't want to ruin the story by telling you the quote, and, but I am waiting for the, for the, for the uh, tech to work. <laughs> Sarah will come and smack something and set it all right. Uh, I need to do that before I came over here. Huh? Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> All right, the Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and no boring and black on oh, black be easier at the <laughs> at the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing peeping old crows is the secret of the lifted lorax And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax and why was it there? Why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old onceler still lives there 
Ask him. He knows. You won't see the onceler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes of miff muffered woof. And on special dank midnights in August, he pecks out of the shutters, and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather's snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you've paid him away in his snug, his strange, strange, his secret strange hole in his groovalous glove. Then he grunts, I, I will call for you by, I will call you by my whispama phone, for the secrets that I tell you are for your ears alone. Slop, down slops the whisper of my phone to your ear, and the old onceler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had small bees up his nose. I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swoomy swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffle trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffle trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbaloots frisking about in their barbaloot suits as they played in the shade and ate truffle of fruits. From the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffle trees, all my life, I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweetest smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. The instant I'd finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of a stump of a tree I had chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy. And he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. And he was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of my truffle a tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a need. A need's a find something that all people need. 
It's a shirt, it's a sock, it's a glove, it's a hat, but it has other uses, yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains or covers, for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth that would buy that fool need. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just at that minute, a chap came along and he thought that the need that I knitted was great. He happily bought it for $3.98. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him, shut up if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all, built a radio phone, I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunzler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast, take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken, Sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunzler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting sneeds, just as busy as bees, to the sound of the chopping of truffle trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So quickly I invented my super ax hacker, which whacked off four truffle trees at one smacker. We, we were making sneeds four times as fast as before and that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots who played in the shade in, the barbalo in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffle of fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffle of fruit to go round. And my poor Barbara Lutz are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food and I hope that they may. Good luck boys, he cried and he sent them away. I, the onceler felt sad as I watched them all go, but Business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies in tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly really did not. But I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory. I biggered my roads. I biggered my wagons. I biggered my loads of thieves I shipped out. I was shipping them forth. To the, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more thieves, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again, he came back. I was fixing some pipes when the old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snarled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a cruffless croak. Onceler, you're making such smogless smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. And so said the Lorax, he's part of my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully no, they may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here.
What's more, snapped the Lorax, his dander was up. Let me say a few words about Gluppity Glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making Gluppity Glup, also Schloppity Schlop. And what do you do with the leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old onceler man, you. You're glumping the pond where the humming fish hum. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truffle of trees into sneeze, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack from outside in the field came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffle a tree of them all. No more trees, no more thieves, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left beneath the bad-smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I. The Lorex said nothing, just gave me a glance and gave me a very sad, sad backward glance. And he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago. But each day since that day, I sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart. I've worried about it with all of my heart. But note, says the Wunzler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the onceler. He lets something fall. It's a truffle of seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffle of seeds. And the truffle of trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. Pretty remarkable that Dr. Seuss had that wisdom 50 years ago. Words we need to hear today. And so 
let us offer to God our thanks and our gifts as we reflect. Oh God, we offer to you nothing more than what you've given to us. We pray that we have been good stewards. And so we ask you to bless the gift and the giver that together we might be about doing your will by sharing good gifts with all. Amen. In our joys and concerns, we have joy for Regina's successful surgery, gratitude for all the prayers. Um, they fixed her up quick and sent her home the same day. And rehab is going well, as I understand, so, so things are good, so we're grateful for that. Herb is also asking for prayers for his sister, Linda, who is dealing with health issues. And are there joys or concerns here? Yes, Jackie. Oh, or, or two Jackies. <laughs> Pick a Jackie. <laughs> yeah. Earthquake in Haiti, and so we're praying for them. And there's also bad weather bearing down on them, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yep, continuing prayers for, for those who are experiencing hunger and homelessness. Yeah, it's remarkable news that, that, uh, that folks are not even able to get treatment in hospitals because beds are taken by folks with COVID. So we are at a turning point that's not good need our prayers yes we continue in our prayers for maria and david who have been getting help through starfish village and uh, maria is pregnant so we pray for health they're both beginning work we need uh, Lots of lots of support, success for them, we pray. Anything else? Well, let's take some silence to listen to our still speaking God who is aware already of all of our prayers. 
those we've spoken and those that we hold close to our hearts. So let us offer yet to our God, our vulnerable joys and concerns and listen for God's reply. Oh God, forgive us for being people who choose to bigger and bigger and bigger. Remind us that you are the source of all and with you there is no need. That if we simply lean on you and follow your direction, we will have all of our needs met. And if we partner with you, and do the creating that you would have us to do, then there would be no need for any. For your plan is that all needs would be met. So help us to get out of the way. Help us to discover your will by going to the margins where you may be found. Help us and sustain us as we face grim futures. Hear our prayers for all those who are suffering around us, for those who have little and no choice. Bring comfort and help us to be those who bring that comfort. And for all those things which worry us all, for those things for which we need to turn around and it may be too late. Help us find hope. Help us find you walking among us as you always do, as you always have, as you did so long ago in the form of your child, our savior, Jesus, the Christ, who left for us words to provide hope and to bind us together with your people in all times and places. Words we pray together now as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our scripture reading today is from Genesis. It's from the Inclusive Bible, Genesis, first chapter, 24th to 31st verses. Then God said, Earth, bring forth all kinds of living soul, cattle, things that crawl, and wild animals of all kinds. So it was. God made all kinds of wild animals and cattle and everything that crawls on the ground, and God saw that this was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection. In the divine image, God created them, female and male. God made them. God blessed them and said, bear fruit 
increase your numbers and fill the earth and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. God then told them, look, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit carries its seed inside itself. They will be your food and to all the animals of the earth and the birds of the air and then and things that crawl on the ground. Everything that has a living soil in it. I give all the green plants for food. So it was. God looked at all of this creation and proclaimed that this was good, very good. Evening came and morning followed the sixth day. This ends the reading of the a scripture reading. So we've been looking at the Phoenix affirmations. Is it still? It's still, there we go. <laughs> this series of 12 affirmations based on the one law that Jesus gave us that breaks down into three parts. The one law, of course, being love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. There are three great loves, love God, love neighbor, love self. And these affirmations are broken down into those three categories, four affirmations for each of them. And we're on number three. Number three, which reads, Christian love of God includes celebrating the God whose spirit pervades and whose glory is reflected in all of God's creation, including the earth and its ecosystems, the sacred and the secular the Christian and non-Christian, the human and non-human. This affirmation breaks down these false walls of division, the division between sacred and secular. That's just a, a construction that we would separate those things for God is present in all, all things are sacred or at least potentially so. It also rejects the separation between religions rejects the separation even between species. We are a part of creation, not apart from it. Too much of the current division we are experiencing is about creating and maintaining these sorts of walls. One that concerns those of us committed to spirituality is this alleged division between faith and science that somehow they're opposed to each other. If we use our reason and our brain, somehow our spirit is being embattled. There is no war between those two. It's simply different categories, different approaches, different ways of seeing things. Think about the stars. You can look at the stars and you can study them using astronomy, using your head, using science. Or you can look at the stars and study them using astrology, using your spirit and your gut, thinking differently. Those two don't argue with each other. They're different fields. They may or may not complement each other or ever overlap, but it's just two different approaches. That's what faith and science really are. Science isn't telling religion that it's wrong. Although we have found, haven't we, that Sometimes religion is telling science that it might be wrong. And that's where we come to this story today, this passage, the creation myth, which you know, of course, there are two, right? If you read the beginning of the book of Genesis, there's, there's all the seven days in the creation, and then there's a creation of humans in the garden, and it's a totally different story written by different people, and we just mash them all together and don't notice the difference. Actually, it took a little bit of science <laughs> to tell us, oh, look, there's a difference in the way these are written. Maybe the sources are different. And that's important for us to, to look at. 
It's also important for us to understand story, that to call it the creation myth is not to degrade it, not to say that it's untrue. In fact, it's quite true. Native storytellers will use the expression, I'm going to tell you a true story. It may have happened this way. It's not about the details, it's about the truth. What does the creation story tell us about creation? It tells us that there was chaos and then there was order. Science can affirm that. Science is looking for the order in the universe. Granted, there's chaos theory, I get that. It's understanding that, that order is something that we impose upon this creation, but it's not totally random. Things happen and, and are predictable, the laws of nature. Well, whether you say that God created the laws of nature or you don't know how they happened, it doesn't make a difference that they exist, they exist. The truth of the story is that we as humans are looking for that order and assigning a, a purpose, a meaning to the work of creation. And we also have a place in creation. Now, science will tell us that every animal has its niche. This, this week, we've been dealing with bats in our house, which we've been trying to explain that's not their home. It's our home. Their home is outside, right? That this is our place. That's their place. Our places have, have gone uh, intermingled there. And it's not always been a, a good, healthy relationship. So we do know that we have those places. But they are artificial, right? The eaves of our house look an awful lot like a home for a bat. I can argue with them all I want. They're going to say, no, this is a nice home for me. I like your attic. <laughs> so we have to persuade them in other ways. The problem with the way that this scripture passage in particular has been read for such a long time is that it's as if we own this place, right? It's as if God told us, this is yours, and then walked away. That's not really what the story says, does it? And we have this problem of the story saying, have dominion over. You know, you didn't hear that in this translation today. You heard about cooperation and collaboration, about taking care of, about finding your place, because that's really what the story is about. Actually, it kind of hinges on a particular um, word in the translation, in the Hebrew, that over word, have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. That word in most other places in the Hebrew scripture, that preposition is translated as with. Now, how different does that sound when you hear have dominion with the birds of the air, have dominion with the fish of the sea? In fact, it makes a heck of a lot more sense because how are you going to have dominion over birds of the air when you can't fly? And how are you going to have dominion over the fish of the sea when you can only hold your breath so long? But to cooperate with and to say, that's your domain and I'm trying to find mine, that you have a place and we're all looking for our place. Well, that's really what this should all be about. Then we got this report this week, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, not so subtly called their report Code Red for Humanity. And there's no quarrel with religion here. In fact, if we religious folks believe that humans need to care about God's creation and the survival of humanity, then we should be concerned about what we read in this report. The researchers and scientists are very clear. We are in deep, deep trouble. They wrote, many changes due to past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible for centuries to millennia. Irreversible for centuries to millennia, especially changes in the ocean, ice sheets, and global sea level. And yet there's more. The details of the report include that humans are to blame for the warming of the planet and there is no debate. It's simply a fact that we are to blame. Temperatures are going to continue to rise. 
we're past the point of no return. The weather is becoming more extreme. The ice caps are disappearing. Arctic summers could be free of snow. Seas are rising and nothing we do will stop them. And they go on in the report to highlight several possible futures, none of which are futures we would choose for ourselves or our children or our children's children. It's something that was reflected in the song sung in the prelude today. We don't own this place, but we act as if we did. It's a loan from the children of our children's kids. The actual owners haven't even been born yet. And we can run, but we cannot hide from it. Of all possible worlds, we've only got this one. We've got to ride on it. Whatever we've done, we'll never get far from what we leave behind. We can run, but we can't hide. And whether we hear it in music or story, scripture, or a UN climate report, it's true that we can run, but we can't hide. We have fundamentally changed the quality of life for every living creature on this planet. So what are we gonna do? What can we do? What do we as people of faith have to offer? Well, first, we need to own the problem. We need to not be debating the point. We need to say, mea culpa. We are guilty. People of faith understand that. Confession is vital. We start there. We have to own this. We have to own the guilt. And we have to start listening to those annoying prophets like the Lorax. They're always annoying. You never want to listen. But when they've proved to be right, you know that you should have been listening. And if it's not too late, you start listening now. One of those folks is someone that perhaps is known to all of you. I had the privilege of serving with him in Massachusetts, Jim Antall, the retired General Minister and President of the Massachusetts Conference has been crying out for years, even when no one would listen, and even after people quit listening to him. And years ago, he said, if faith leaders don't start speaking about the damage we are causing our planet, then we will reach a point when all we will ever talk about is grief. In his book, Climate Church, Climate World, he writes, only by fully grieving all that we have lost can we fully enter into the new tomorrow that God is preparing. We have so much to mourn. Personal grief over loved ones lost and homes destroyed. Ubiquitous grief over the long emergency that has straitjacketed our lives. And anticipatory grief over the catastrophe that we are handing over to our children. We need to acknowledge our grief over the ongoing ruination of creation. Only by doing so can we be receptive to a message of hope. We must be open to receiving that difficult message if we're going to receive a message of hope. This affirmation also speaks about the breaking down of that barrier between Christian and non-Christian. And perhaps one of the things we ought to do is to consider the wisdom of other traditions that aren't our own. Because a lot of times when we hear those truths from other stories, we find that they exist in our own story as well. In the shamanic traditions, it's understood that the healer, the the shaman, the, the medicine person, is often the one who has suffered, the one who was ill and then recovered from it, the one who was wounded. To be a healer is to have been wounded and overcome. That's 
common in those traditions. Carl Jung picked up on that and called that concept the wounded healer, a term then borrowed by Henry Nouwen, a Christian writer. And he encouraged us to take this concept of wounded healer and embrace it, to stop trying to hide our hurt, stop trying to hide our guilt and our shame, to move from shame and try to use what we know from our brokenness in service to others so that we might move from shame to healing. We might move from grief to hope. So we begin by embracing our woundedness, our healing can come. And of course we need an action. We need a call to action. We need to know we're doing something. Grounded in our faith, knowing where we're coming from and trusting in our God to show us our place, what is it that we can do? These actions are suggestions from another conference, but they're good. So I'm going to share them here. Acknowledge feelings of grief, guilt, and despair at climate-related news. Be willing to sit with others, talk about it, grieve together, complain together, start there. Foster hope by remembering that God calls us as the beloved community to co-create God's reign of justice and mercy. This is our work. So tell the stories, dream the dreams, tell the stories, whether they're from scripture or other texts or from your own life, of the marvelous things that God has done through people working together. Believe that there is a possible future that God has in store and is working out through us. We start with story. And then choose one small step to reduce your energy use or waste over the next month or two. And then celebrate. Celebrate each step along the way. Do what you can. Perhaps Reduce your paper waste, perhaps making a small adjustment to your thermostat setting or turning your electronics off when they're not in use. And if you've already done these things, then think about the next step. What might you do to get better renewable energy for your own personal use? What bigger steps might be in store for you? Stay connected with others who are committed to remedying the climate crisis. There are people even here, and do you know who they are? Now you do. <laughs> Your creation care committee, <laughs> Bill and Sally and Frank and Denise and Dave and Steve, they're already thinking and talking and acting. You want to respond to the grief and try to find hope, act with them connect with them, find ways to do something. And I can assure you that there are lots of ideas going around in that group. And all they need is some fertile soil, and that's all of us. And finally, contact your elected officials. It's always the thing that seems to be so hard for people to do. But you know, if you're on a stream and, and there are people who are injured floating down there and you're taking them out and caring for them, that's wonderful. But guess what? Something terrible is happening upstream. So the work of mercy needs to be complemented by the work of justice. And that means changing the system. And we elect our officials to do that for us and to represent our view. Well, what is our view? Well, they don't know if we don't tell them. So call them. These two, there's the numbers, get your paper out, write it down. You should have these in your phone, call them. Tell them to take seriously climate change, to respond to the UN uh, report, to put money in the budget because that's how the work happens. This is not one of those other walls that we have to avoid, church and state. This is citizens being active because we've been motivated by our faith, because we care. And it's time, well past time that we do at least that because there's so much that does need to do. So we sit with grief in these days, but we also act 
with hope. The story of faith is one of life, death, and life again. It's a story of hope, despair, and hope again. We must do all that we can to protect our little corners of the world, to show love for those things that we can. And maybe each of us, all of us, loving our little bit of creation will be enough to save the world. Jim Antal puts it this way. Hope is the most important contribution people of faith can and must make as humanity confronts the climate crisis. To become people of hope, we must be willing to stare reality in the face. Hope is the most important contribution that we can make. Or perhaps it's the words of Lorax, the words that graced the invitation to my installation service, my first installation. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Amen. So go forth from this place and know your place. Seek it out. Do the right good, the one that you're called to, not some other good, certainly not some other wrong. Follow where Christ leads you, wherever that is this week. And in doing so, give glory to God, the creator. Our creator, God, who knows even the sparrow that falls. May this God lift you on gentle breezes that you may soar with eagles and bless you with the gift of wisdom and vision and give glory to the Christ who comes to you still in the form of the least, the last, and the lost. May Christ bless you with the gift of tears that you may shed them with those who suffer. 
and give glory to God's spirit, God's wild, untamed spirit, wild as any wild goose. May this wild goose spirit of our untamed God lead you into places where you may not go on your own and bless you with a touch of foolishness that you will fearlessly go where angels fear to tread. And may the love of God be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom none but God loves now and until that day of God's judgment when justice will roll down like waters and peace will blossom among all the peoples. Amen. Thank you.